everyone. My name is Mihai Spintescu. I'm a partner with VTS Capital Partners. We're a regional venture capital and uh, private equity firm active in Central uh, and Eastern Europe. We cover um, the space from 200,000 euros to 20 million euros through various funds that uh, are active in Romania and in the region. Um, we invest in startups as an exception, <laughs> so, uh, and that is a, notably that exception means uh, serial entrepreneurs like, like Radu here. Um, however, I did invest in a startup uh, with my own money uh, in, in um, 2006. Uh, so we have an angel so awesome. When I was uh, um, not in the VC space, but, uh, but acting as, uh, as an entrepreneur. Thank you. Cool. Christian? Yes, hello, my name is uh, Christian Leibold. I'm a partner with uh, eVenture Capital Partners. We manage a set of funds that invest fairly globally actually in consumer internet companies. So very focused in terms of only doing early stage consumer internet investments starting with a few hundred thousand up to a few million, three million, four million maybe in the initial investment. We do that out of our main offices in San Francisco and Hamburg, Germany but we're also present with an office in Moscow, um, in Asia, and in Brazil, because we believe that consumer internet is becoming increasingly global. Good ideas travel very fast, and there is a lot of value to be created by connecting the dots internationally. Um, notable investments of ours that you might recognize uh, are Groupon, uh, Angie's List, um, Shopping.com, Delicious, things like that. So all very consumer internet focused. And uh, I joined the firm in 2003, early 2003, with a background as an electrical engineer. And um, so I started as an associate, and I probably was sort of helping make uh, my first investment uh, because it was really the responsibility of a partner at the time uh, in early 2004. Cool. Dan? Uh, Dan Lupu, uh, an investment director with uh, Intel Capital which is a business unit of uh, Intel Corporation, the company I don't need to introduce to you. Uh, we have a fairly broad investment uh, mandate in terms, uh, both in terms of uh, sectors of interest, basically anything that uh, deals with the technology. Uh, early investors in uh, companies that became uh, quite, uh, quite big in the end. Uh, we were investors in uh, Yandex, for example, in, uh, in Russia, in uh, here in Romania, the smallest investment that we that we looked at because we did not uh, conclude it was uh, 200,000 euros. But uh, I would say that this was rather the exception. Uh, I would be the one to talk to you once you raise your first uh, round and you have a working company and working product, and you want to expand globally. So I'm not going to go through my background uh, <laughs> again, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about Daddy Hansen. So we're based in London, but Daddy Hansen actually as a company has offices all over Europe, so almost every major European city ha uh, we have an office in. The tech fund is in London, Munich, and San Francisco, and we do uh, a variety of areas. We've done a lot in clean tech, do a lot in consumer internet, a lot in mobile, uh, and we've also done bo both business and, and consumer stuff. Uh, in, in the mobile sector. And then we also do uh, software as a service and, and more B2B companies. Uh, do early stage, so we focus a lot on, on usually the first round of institutional capital, so about the A round, although we've been looking more and more at, at seed funds, uh, seed funding as well, so you know, starting to maybe move down towards the 250 to 500,000 level as well. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, I'm Radu Georgescu. I'm a funny animal. I'm both entrepreneur and investor. Um, I pitch myself every morning and uh, very rarely win some money. Uh, sometimes I have other people pitching to me. Sometimes I pitch myself to, to other investors. So kind of fancy uh, experience here. Um, I started my First company back in 92, sold it to Autodesk Distributor in 94. Started my second company, then actually started a, like five companies, four of them failed, one of them sold to Microsoft in 2003. Then started another set of companies, a few of them failed. Uh, one sold last year to Naspers. 
Uh, now we just moved together one of uh, the companies to the US preparing to IPO it on NASDAQ a few years uh, from now and actively looking for, uh, for seed investments again. Cool. Okay, so uh, let's get one thing straight. These guys want your money, obviously, in some way or another. Um, one of the things we've talked individually uh, before the panel was of how people approached you when they approached you and that sometimes, unfortunately, they didn't approach you uh, even if they sh should have. Uh, what's the point, depending on the stage that you invest in, that a startup or a company that's emerging should really contact you? Is it, for example, in the earliest stages just for the contact? Is it right before they're ready to be evaluated by you? What's the like critical point they should like send that email? Uh, Dan, you mentioned that you don't really invest in startups, so what do you think? Actually, I think uh, it's important to get uh, to get in touch with people, even if uh, they don't invest in uh, in the stage you are of money you are looking for, uh, because you get them uh, you get them to know you, and uh, as you g become successful, you will end up needing to talk to people that are investing uh, uh, in other rounds, in more money. So uh, I would say that uh, there is no critical moment. You shouldn't uh, refrain from uh, talking to me because simply because uh, I find it more difficult to invest in uh, startups. And uh, in terms of getting in touch, I, I think uh, these kind of events are, are great because uh, they are quite concentrated. Uh, email out of the blue, it's, uh, it's fairly acceptable. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't put the blame on, some, uh, on somebody that doesn't have the, the network to, to, to get introduced. And also, I'm uh, quite shameless. If I hear, hear anything about the company, I get in touch with them, so you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't worry if, uh, if investors uh, contact you directly. So basically, they, after this panel, they should like, come here, ask you for your business card, and like, let's talk. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure, no problem. So we shouldn't be, we, most probably we won't be able to have a meaningful conversation at the moment, but at least we know, we, we put a face on the name and we can get in touch by Skype by, uh, over a beer or something afterwards. Mm -hmm. Guys, why do you think that in most cases, unfortunately, the example we always give is, give is that in Silicon Valley, everyone comes after you after after a talk. Why why doesn't that happen at conferences in in Central and Eastern Europe? What can we change here? What 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 can an entrepreneur expect when they're talking to you, for example, at a conference like this or contacting you the first time? Is it like okay, we see you, or can they get a straight answer or feedback about their startup? What's the best that they can hope for? in a first contact. Christian? Yeah. So I think, as you said, you know, it's not going to be a meaningful conversation. You're not going to walk away with a check. Yeah. Um, that said, though, I would absolutely chase anybody at a conference that you think might just have some money in his pockets. Because what you can walk away with is, of course, the business card, but sort of a warm intro. Yeah. It's a lot better to then follow up with an email and say, like, look, we met, and, you know, I feel kind of obliged to reply to people and to invest the time into coming up with a you know, fairly reasonable answer if I have met that person. If it's an email that's just kind of you know, coming to my box and I might feel like, hey, it's been sent to 500 other people the same way, um, you know, it's a lot, let's say, more difficult for me to really invest the time to come up with a, with a good answer. So I think the best thing you can hope for is really making yourself um, memorized and then picking up the conversation in a more meaningful manner afterwards by sending over an executive summary, a link to your website, a couple lines that explain what you're doing and getting the interest. Sparking the interest, getting somebody curious about what you're doing, that's the purpose of you know, those two minutes that you spend talking to an investor here in the hallway, maybe five minutes, and then you follow up afterwards. Uh, um, what, one, one thing I, w I was thinking, uh, seeing the, the, the pitches before and, and all this thing, I, I really believe that um, any entrepreneur that wants to get money should be able to get to the investors. Uh, following everything we guys are, are, are telling you and following the books and all the stuff, it's following the right path. It's 
I don't think it's going to get you somewhere. Being an, a successful entrepreneur, you need to find your own way. And if, if I or if us are having all the doors closed, the, fact, the, the simple fact that you are able to, to get past these doors and to get to us and to raise our attention, this makes us feel that you are going to make it with your business. If you would expect us to come to you and beg, you know, give, uh, uh, allow us to invest in your business, that means that you are going to do the same with your customers. Put a product there as, and have customers beg you to get their money. So basically what I think is that it's your job <coughs> to find your way to the money. It's your job to find your way to the, to the investor's money. It's your job to find your way to your customer's heart and to their pocket. So I really think that this is what makes the difference between a good entrepreneur and a bad entrepreneur. A good entrepreneur would make it, would not necessarily uh, need to be trained by us or by whoever in how to get our money. They're just going to do it. So, you know, my, my piece of, adv of advice is, you know, just make your way to our heart and pitch us once, twice, three times, four times. Get us accustomed to your, to your vision and, you know, maybe we're not going to invest today, but as Dan said, you know, we're going to invest in, in A round and, or in B round or whenever and, you know, just make your way out. Yeah, so ju just to add, maybe to put things in a different perspective, when you're raising funds for your company, you're actually uh, selling shares in your company. And, and you can think of the investors, VC included, uh, as your customers, uh, as your clients. So in a way, you know, even if you don't want to do a fundraising uh, next week, maybe you do it in six months, you know, it's like with a client for a product that you're developing, but it's not yet ready. I mean, it doesn't harm to charm him because uh, him or her, because in the end, you know, you would want that guy to buy. Uh, and, 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 and so it's very similar here, you know, we're like uh, a potential client uh, and you want us to, to know you and to like you. And you know, whenever you want to sell something, uh, people will be much more interested if they, if they know you and if they like you, rather than, you know, just meeting you for the first time when, when you want to, to pitch for, uh, for the money. Okay, so what, what, you're, what you're saying is basically what I see here is being consi consistent in contacting VCs, contacting investors. What would, now that's all fine and dandy, but what's that in practice? Is that sending an email every three weeks saying, okay, we're doing this, it might interest you? Is it like just staying in touch? Is it? I think, I think you know, f first of all, you, you have to get, you know, to get yourself introduced and, and give this, uh, maybe 30 second or three minute speech about you know what you do, what's your plan, who are your partners. Uh, and then I think you know, every once in a while when, when you do something, when you achieve a milestone, so it's not right you know, three weeks, but maybe you, know, you, you have your uh, beta version ready or you launch your product or you, you just hire this extraordinary guy from a multinational and is going to help you with that. Or, you know, whenever it's uh, something important happens, you just let people know, and uh, you know, it's it's a, it's like with a customer, you know, just build up build up the um, the story, and then you keep them interested. I think there is a very good analogy, actually. If you, a lot of people say taking VC money is a little bit like a marriage between the entrepreneur and the VC. So think of it as dating. Yeah. So when you're trying to get a woman interested in you. You don't spam her, right? You carefully doze sort of the interest. There's a little bit of scarcity that's necessary. You don't call back right away. You know, make it feel like there is other interest. All those things. All those things work perfectly in a fundraising process. It's about creating scarcity and momentum when you're talking to investors. And so the dating analogy, of course, has its limits, but it's a good start, maybe. Okay, so... <laughs> What's the best startup date you've been to? And uh, like a concrete example, you don't need to name a startup, but an experience with a startup you would treasure for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, so there is, really, there is really the two extremes, but um, there is one particular company uh, that I have to admit, it wasn't really our investment focus. And so I initially said no, and the guy, 
I, I said, you know, it's not worth for us, for you to come to Hamburg and take the meeting because it's not in our focus and so on. He was like, no, but I think, you know, it's really different. You should really look at what we're doing. I was like, okay. Yeah, and I said no three times. And then, you know, but he always came back with sort of very good arguments why I should invest the time to meet with him. And it's not that I'm that important that, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't have an, half an hour to meet a good entrepreneur. It's just really that, you know, he had to make the trip and, and you think about, is it worth it? And ultimately we ended up investing because we just felt that the entrepreneur was so strong, he was so good in, in pushing through his agenda and, you know, trying to convince people that even though it was slightly outside of our focus, um, we made the investment. So there are other cases where we chased entrepreneurs and then, you know, we do the exactly the same thing. We just invested in Nginx, which is a Russian company that's, uh, some of you might know, it's a web server, uh, open source web server. And uh, the founder there, he was originally not of the mindset to start a company, but we approached him and said like, hey, you know, can we turn this into a company? Um, and and uh, so it's, you know, we have to do the same thing as well. So I know kind of a little bit also what it feels to be on the other side when you're trying to get an entrepreneur to say, hey, can we invest in your business? Hmm. Uh, Sita, at the end of your presentation, you mentioned game over. So start again, start, start playing the game. Uh, how, you also mentioned basically having a vision. What, in, in your case, as a product person, does a vision entail? So that's a, that's a slide in a deck. But what does, a, what does an entrepreneur have to do to really like, emphasize the vision of their product in, in like a deck of six slides for you to say at least, okay, interesting, I may follow up? So, I don't know, the, the way I think of, of companies is I think, so does a product solve a problem? Or it could be, are you addressing a, a need that people don't even know they have? So is it something new? Um, that's kind of tick number one. But the other thing I think about is, what is a valuable asset that you're going to create long term? So I was thinking, in, in web shops, you can't, I remember I used to get this argument, so wh when I joined Allianz, they didn't do actually any internet companies because they just thought it wasn't defensible. And th no, th they're wrong, and they were wrong about that, and, and so we moved on from that. Um, but one of, the, one, one of the things I think that I, I always look at is, what is a valuable asset that you're going to have in two, three, four years from now? So you have this you know, big vision, you have a product, but are you really building something? And I usually put it into four buckets. It's either a network of engaged users, it's data that can be quite valuable. Uh, SoundCloud bit fit both of those. Um, MegaZebra fits one of them, so network of engaged users. Uh, it's sometimes intellectual property, although I'm not a really big believer in, in most intellectual property for web and, and mobile startups, uh, at least not on the consumer side, and uh, a customer base. So if you're an e-commerce company, you know, the only thing you can do when you get customers is to sell them more stuff. So if you have a customer base and you're building a huge customer base, are there other things you can sell to that customer base? And so, so what, what, I try, what I think about is wherever you are now, it's probably like day zero or day one, you know, in three years, what is that asset? So this big vision has to, I think, in, involve creating one of those as a byproduct. And that's, that's the, the value that, that you're creating. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Can I uh, just make a, a lateral comment? Uh, we are always talking about vision and product. Please start with the product. You can talk all you want about your vision once you get me to understand what the product is. All, I mean, a lot of times I get this, we want to change the world. Okay, first, everybody wants to change the world. I agree with you, that's, that's great. But first, tell me how do you want to do it, okay? So first, focus on product. Make me understand what the product is. Then talk about the vision. Once you know that I know the product. Sometimes people come in and they have a vision of the vision. That's a little too high level then, yeah? Cool. Uh, as Citrus, for example, a product person, uh, and, and you talked about having like, the, making you understand the product and so on. How do people, uh, get to understand you, get to know that you're the right person to maybe pitch a product that's specific for e-commerce or, I don't know, gaming or is based in Romania, whatever. So do they, do, should they like follow your blog? Should they like follow you on Twitter? How important is it for you to like personally understand the product 
or is it just a case, okay, this is interesting, I'll refer to a colleague who has more experience with that? What's your experience so far? Yeah, obviously, you know, for, for um, um, country-based um, uh, funds or even regional funds, it, it happens that you, you don't have in one country, you know, all the, uh, all the sector speci specialities. Um, but I think, you know, initially you, you probably want to meet the, the person on the ground there and then he or she will uh, e either discuss with a, with a colleague that has more experience in that particular uh, industry or with that particular product. Or, and then, you know, we usually in 3TS we create, um, uh, we have, you know, one person from, from the country and another from the industry. So, so we, can, we try to combine both, um, uh, uh, the, you know, the expertise. Um, so, so I think, you know, in initially, again, you know, we want to meet uh, for, for, the, for the funds that have um, uh, offices in, in <coughs> Romania. You want to, to meet them first. I, th I think for, for uh, uh, European or international funds, then probably, yes, I would say, you know, that you, you, you kind of want to look at who is the, uh, who's the specialist in your, in your uh, industry or your product and then probably approach him or her directly, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I think you have to reverse engineer the fund. Yeah. So you essentially look at who are the people on the website, try to figure out what deals they have done, um, and then see if there are any sort of common joints, things that have something to do with your company. If you pitch me on a clean tech company, I'm just not going to know what you're what you're talking about. And you might have the best business in the world. I'm just going to be too stupid to understand it. Yeah. And so I'm not. I might pass it on to somebody. I mean, we don't do clean tech, but. Um, it'd be better if you get to the right guy first. So reverse engineer the fund. Um, and then the other advice I would give is, uh, some people say I really only want to talk to a partner because they're the guys who are the ultimate decision makers. Yes, that's true. But focus on associates. You know, if you get in through the associates, they're much more responsive. They have less commitments in terms of looking after portfolio companies and other things. And they're usually very hungry to bring a deal to the partnership. So if you see there are some good associates, so essentially, you know, anybody who's not a partner yet in the fund and whether they're called analysts or senior associate or whatever really doesn't matter, just focus on these people because they are sometimes much more eager to bring you to the attention of the partnership and they may be closer to what you're doing. You know, I'm already too old for the hottest, newest Facebook company. Yeah, you know, the guys who were working with us who were right out of school, they know this stuff a lot better than I do and they will understand much more quickly than I do what it is that's cool about what you're doing if you are in that space. So don't always just shoot for the partners. Um, the, the, there are two ways of, of uh, doing the, this kind of, of pitching. I mean, uh, the, you, you go to the partners if you want to do an ambush. Uh, so one, one way is you, you go to the fund and say, and, and have a really strong argument and tell them you got to invest in our company until tomorrow. And you have to have all the, all, all the reasons to, to convince them, to tell them that if they are not gonna invest, that if they are not gonna sign the check until tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you know, they are losing the best ride of their lives. If you do this, you go directly to the partner, pitch it, you know, drunk him, do whatever you want, just get the check until tomorrow. And I've seen these things happening. The other way is, you know, just doing a two years war, which, you know, every six months reporting and uh, dating and all this stuff. And this you do reverse engineering, do all the analysts in the fund and do, do all the stuff. But in order, when, whenever you decide that you want to get the money, you need to decide on one of the other track. In order to get the first one, which is possible, but very unlikely, you need to really have, you know, whatever it takes to do this. And this is when you go really upstairs. If you do it the other way, you just start working hard and, you know, understanding what the fund is, who the guys are, and, and going all the way. Mm -hmm. So, why do you think that a lot of startups are, are looking at, for example, Y Combinator, and uh, seed camp is, is a standard now almost for, for a lot of startups in, in Central Eastern Europe. But a lot of them are looking at 
US VCs for like, okay, we need these guys, we can't find investors uh, in Europe. You think it's seriously that much of a problem to find investment in Europe for a startup, for example, from Romania, Serbia, or the Czech Republic? Or do they just not know right, like, like the right way to go about it? I think that there is some basis for people wanting to go into US. I don't buy that uh, money is not available in uh, Europe. We have, uh, I'm based in Bucharest and uh, we have people on the ground covering the entire region, uh, the whole of Europe. <coughs> uh, there, is a, there is a basis in that uh, the ecosystem in, uh, in US is, uh, uh, is stronger, not only in terms of uh, executing the deal, so uh, VCs, uh, availability of capital, uh, lawyers and accountants in order to execute the deals, but also in terms of uh, the networks that are that are helping you actually to 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 build your company, make the introductions, n uh, know the right people. So basically, there is there is availability of this scarce resource in uh, in uh, uh, in the region. The problem is getting to the getting to the right people, and I would caution the against focusing too much on uh, the benefits that, uh, that a hotshot VC or Y Combinator would bring to, to a local uh, company. Uh, I've seen cases in which companies are getting into Y Combinator and then uh, asking for five times the valuation just because they went uh, through Y Combinator, nothing more. This is totally the wrong way to, uh, to approach it. So try to understand what everybody can bring to, to the table. Actually. Disagree. I think there's a huge problem uh, with a lack of capital in Europe. I think there's a, probably more seed funding now than there ever has been before. There's still not enough angel funding, and there's virtually no A, a round and B round funding. There's a lot of late stage capital, there's a lot of kind of early seed capital, but there isn't enough capital for when you've maybe got the product out, it's launched, but it hasn't really grown enough yet, um, and someone's willing to do two to three million euros. It's like they want you to go from product to you know the 20 million round, but n there isn't enough in, in between. Um, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why I see a lot of companies going over to the US is because you know they can raise three, four million dollars quite easily there, or easier, it's never easy, uh, but, it, but it, it, it can be a lot easier there. So, so I, I do think it's a problem, and I think the other problem is, particularly with consumer companies, for some reason, uh, I think the VCs in, in Europe are <laughs> really risk averse, uh, which is exactly the wrong uh, characteristic for a VC to have. Um, but a far, far too many of them are, are just scared of, of taking on real risk in their investments. So there's a lot of e-commerce funding, for example. E-commerce is pretty much the easiest thing you could invest in uh, because you make money right away. And there isn't a lot of risk in that business model. Um, and I think some of the more risky stuff um, is quite difficult because when you don't know how you're going to make money for two or three years, uh, it's just not companies that I think VCs in Europe are, are in a mindset to invest in. And it's unfortunate because I think that some of those are, are the biggest ones. Yeah, maybe just to give an example here, uh, 3TS um, through 3TS Cisco Fund um, invested in, uh, in Avangate, which is one of uh, Sky Commerce as it's called now which is one of uh, Radu Georgescu's uh, businesses, uh, then we relocated that, uh, that business in US and are, are now preparing for an IPO on NASDAQ. And, and this is just to prove that uh, a European fund together with a European entrepreneur um, you know, have, have been able to successfully uh, move the headquarter there and, and, and hire um, an American management team and, and uh, make the business truly global just to prove the point that uh, there, are m there is money and there is also uh, talent here uh, and uh, you know, can work uh, probably, we understand much better uh, a local entrepreneur than, uh, than an American VC. So, okay, there, there's money. There's not enough early money um, to get the company going. What would you personally do if you were in a situation, again, Romania, Croatia, Serbia, whatever, and you wanted to create a global business like many of these guys want to do and you can't bootstrap it, you can't sell your product online unfortunately of various reasons. What would you do in that situation to reach that critical point where you can 
there's a point to getting more money to uh, create an even bigger product. Is it just like fools, friends, and family, or is there any smarter ways? Yeah, I think it's, you know, obviously first you go <coughs> to family and friends, um, and, and then I think business angels are also important in, in the, in the um, initial, initial phase. Um, sometimes, especially if you're a serial entrepreneur or you have a very good personal track record, you could also go to, uh, to VCs. For instance, for us, the main reason we don't do startups is because the team is not tested. So maybe you know, maybe they have a good idea, but that doesn't tell you anything about their execution capability. And 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 this business is not about it having the the idea; it's about having the execution capability. Um, and and execution capability also means that the 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 team, the management team, or the founders, if you want, uh, can work well together. Uh, they get along; they are complementary. And that's very, very difficult to assess for uh, for a startup. For an existing company, even if they have like just one year, I mean, you know, you know, at least you can see that they they get along. They, you know, you understand who does what in in that team, uh, and 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 and, it, and you can see some some sales. Uh, you can see some customers. So you know, it's, you, you can also get feedback from the, from the customers about them. Um, so, so for us, that's the, um, actually the main deterrent to do startups is, is because we cannot properly assess the execution capability of, capability of the team. Having said that, if it's a serial entrepreneur, uh, you know, the, the fact that he was successful before, it's the living proof that he can likely do it again. Uh, and then we would, you know, we would probably bet some money on the fact that the guy would be able again to have a successful team and and, and you know lead them to uh, to success. Yeah, I think you know it's true. We talked about not there being enough capital, and I, I fully second what you said. I think there is not enough. However, if you look at it from the bright side, you're in an area where there is a lot of technology talent, and the cost basis is a lot lower than in Silicon Valley or you know some other parts of Europe. So here with less money, you can develop great products, you have great talent, and the best thing about the internet is that a great product always wins no matter where it comes from. So to the extent that with local money or local business angel funding, you can build a product that's demonstrable and maybe has shown some initial usage or traction online, I think then you have something that you can take either to whether it's London or wherever, you know, there are other investors or even the US and you can get that funded. Getting back to Nginx, which I had just mentioned, was written and coded by a single programmer be based in Moscow. We found him and then invested together with Michael Dell and, and Runa Capital, which is, you know, the founder of Parallels and, and sort of a couple other Russian IT companies. So, you know, it goes to the extent that this guy was in Moscow himself building a product and then got singled out by investors who actually went there to identify him. So it's completely possible from here or anywhere in the world to build a leading consumer internet product if you have the right technology talent. So go that route first. Hopefully you need little money to get it rolling, get a prototype, and the cost of you know, doing that has come down a lot, luckily. And then once you have a product, I think you can raise money from various places in the world and um, you know whether it's in Europe or the US. So being in the internet industry, you're actually in a much better position than being in any other industry that you would be trying to raise money for. Cool. Okay, well, let's just take some questions to finish it off. So come on startups, what do you want to ask the, these guys who are going to give you lots and lots of money in some stage? Okay, can I get a mic to the guy? Here it comes. We should have tweeted it, actually. Hi. Hello. It's greencaller.com again. Hello. Uh, question is, uh, is there any specific activities that the VCs prefer to invest to? I mean, that is it the marketing and sales that they prefer to invest to, or is it the development, or is it totally depends on? Uh, Was I clear? Or if if you if if I understand you is the, uh, you meant either uh, market for them or so what would okay so yeah take it then. 
I have a very strong <laughs> opinion on this. Uh, so I, I always like companies that focus on product, obviously. Uh, but I also, but it's for good reason, because I think product is the highest point of leverage of any company. So if you are investing in development, um, you get much, much higher return putting money into your product than you do uh, marketing or sales. So, so especially at the very early stage, uh, I like to see mostly in, in the use of funds, just hiring developers <laughs> and hiring uh, development talent. Or if you're a games company, hiring you know designers and developers and etc. Et I'm right the opposite. I, I love my money going into sales and growing business. I think uh, you should make a, you should uh, make the difference between sales and sales and marketing. Because a lot of people uh, go around asking uh, VCs for marketing money, which most probably they, they intend to spend on uh, ad words or whatever other form of, uh, of uh, advertising. Uh, and usually the argument goes, uh, look, I'm already, I'm not even public, I'm in beta and I have uh, 1,500 users or 15,000 users. Imagine how many I will have if I will start spending money on marketing. This is exactly the wrong way to, to, to get people to give you money because nobody will give you money in order for you to do, uh, to do advertising campa campaigns. You need, to get to, uh, you need to get the money in order to get to the next level, build an additional feature, do some sales if you want, whenever you can demonstrate that there is a sales process and you have your, sale, uh, and you have your customers. But don't ask for sales and marketing money, okay? Uh, any more Thanks. questions? Can't see any. Not even one. There's one. Last question. Let's get it. Okay, so uh, I would like to ask uh, Christian about the uh, Nginx uh, investment, how it's going so far, because we have heard the mantra we only invest in team than more, one of more than one guy, because what happens if he gets sick? for example, and uh, also uh, can you tell us more about your delicious uh, uh, experience? Uh, it's uh, being reborn now. Uh, it was a really great service, like the pilot of the social web. People get really accustomed to it and then it lost itself. Now it's, if you know something about the future of the service, you'll be great. Yeah. Okay, um, so starting with Nginx, yeah. Uh, that's true. Um, generally, you'd like to have a team, of course, but um, first of all, actually, uh, Igor, the founder, teamed up with a partner to cover the business side and help him sort of, you know, build a real company around it. Um, and, and that commitment was necessary for fun funding to make sense, really. Right? Um, so I think the question is, is that a killer criterion in the very beginning if there is only one person? No. The question is, are you willing to build a team down the road? If you want to continue running this as a one-man shop for the next two years, that's not something that makes sense as a VC. So, and how is it going? I mean, we're extremely excited. Again, I, it's, it's, you know, we spend about a year um, working on making that deal happen. Um, we think there is extreme potential there. I mean, you know, websites like LinkedIn, all those guys are, are running Nginx. It's really state of the art for, for all database driven web servers. And, and the, let's say there is a lot that can be done there. So, so we just invested very recently. Um, and uh, so far, at least I would say we're very, very excited and I don't see that changing. Um, delicious. Um, Joshua Schachter uh, was in a um, somewhat almost similar position. He started out building the Delicious project for his own use while he was working in, I believe it was system administration for an investment bank on Wall Street. So this was something he created as a side project and that you know then started being used among friends and getting a lot of traction. So it was not something that he started with the purpose of building a company. It just so happened. And then it got picked up by the community. Suddenly became you know one of the sort of two um, emblematic Web 2.0 initial companies, Flickr and, and Delicious. And uh, again, that was something where we actually competed to, um, to get into the deal and to be able to invest. Um, and, uh, you know, the company was sold relatively early in its lifetime to Yahoo, which 
you know, was a very good financial return from a financial perspective. It was a very successful deal. From a product perspective, it was, an, uh, you know, uh, let's say maybe not the best thing that ever happened to Delicious, to put it mildly, um, because certainly, you know, it has not lived up to the potential it may have had. Now, you know, we like, of course, the fact that it's being resurrected and um, that, you know, hopefully it's now going to, um, let's say, uh, see its true potential. That said, we're no longer involved. We exited the company. We sold our shares when the company was sold to Yahoo. Um, and so as of that point in time, um, we were no longer involved, just as well as Joshua Schachter has, you know, subsequently moved on from, uh, from Yahoo. So I don't have, unfortunately, any insights um, other than that I'm personally, as a user, happy that, you know, it's getting some uh, new, new life uh, into it.